If you want a recipe for a religious reformation, then the first ingredient is a saucy reformer. The second ingredient is corruption in the church, you know, something that needs reforming. And the thing is, the Catholic Church had both of these ingredients on several occasions before the Protestant Reformation. In the 14th century, you had John Wycliffe, who was trying to reform the Catholic Church in England. In the 15th century, you had Jan Hus trying to snuff the corruption out of Prague. But neither of these reformers had the kind of explosive impact that our boy Martin Luther did, and that's because he had the third ingredient to reformation, something so spicy that it would lead to the fundamental altering of the religious landscape of Europe. And that spice is the printing press. And mm, that is tasty, so if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, then let's get to it. What's that? You want follow along note guides for this video? <laughs> Check the link in the description. Yes, it was the printing press that created the occasion for Martin Luther's reforms to actually take root in much of Europe in a way that no prior church reformer had been able to muster. And one of Luther's main arguments is that the Bible ought to be translated into German, which is to say he believed in the need for vernacular Bibles, vernacular being the language of the people. I can see that you've not yet fallen out of your chair in amazement, so allow me to explain why your mind should be blown by that. For centuries, the Bible was only available in Latin, and Latin was sort of the official ecclesiastical language of the Catholic Church. In fact, if you go to the Vatican today, you can still get money out of an ATM with Latin prompts, you know, if that's the kind of thing you're into. But anyway, the fact that the Bible and the liturgy of the Church and all the official documents of the Church were written in Latin meant that only a small handful of priests and cardinals and bishops could actually read and interpret those texts for the rest of the people who very much did not speak Latin. And so you can see that if only one group can read and interpret these documents, there's an awful lot of power bound up in that ability. So when Luther comes along and it's all like, y'all need to be reading the Bible for yourself, so crank up the presses and print some in German. It was a powerful threat to the authority of the Catholic Church. And that press for vernacular Bibles spread so that by 1523 there was a French translation of the New Testament and an English version by 1526, all of which were actively suppressed and opposed by the Catholic authorities. But thanks to the printing press, there was no amount of suppression that kept this movement for vernacular Bibles from spreading spreading widely across Europe. Now, not only did religious reformers challenge church authority, in some places they began challenging state authority as well. And for an example of that, let's head to England. So the Protestant Church of England, otherwise known as the Anglican Church, was established not because the warm fires of reform were burning in the chest of the English, but rather because the diaper baby King Henry VIII couldn't get the Catholic Church to grant him a divorce. So he went ahead and established the Church of England and set himself up as the head of the church and got that divorce. However, the Anglican Church wasn't that much different in practice than the Catholic Church. And so a few decades later, under the reign of Elizabeth I, a group of reformers known as the Puritans rose up to challenge those lingering vestiges of Catholicism that hung around the Church of England. Now, Puritans were of the Calvinist persuasion, and their attempts at reform ultimately led them into conflict with the Stuart monarchs, namely James I and Charles I in the first half of the 17th century. And this conflict would ultimately lead to the English Civil War, on which more in another video, and in this conflict, the Puritans would come out victorious. And because the Puritans were Calvinist, it shouldn't surprise you that they got so tangled up in the affairs of the state. After all, in John Calvin's Geneva, church and state were almost inseparable. So in both of these instances, Protestant Christians refused to recognize the subordination of the church to the state. However, another group, namely the Anabaptists, interacted with the state in the exact opposite way. They believed in the absolute separation of church and state. You know, that was fine until their monarch started calling them up for military service. Anabaptists steadfastly refused such calls on account of their religious convictions mandated them to prioritize the spiritual life rather than their secular commitments. But even with their separatist sentiments, you can see it's just another way of saying that the church is in no way subordinate to the state. So, I don't think it's too much to say at all that the spiciest ingredient of the Reformation stew was the printing press, and thanks to its power to spread Reformation ideas throughout Europe, both the religious and the political fabric of Europe fundamentally shifted. I know you want more videos on Unit 2, so click right here and may all your dreams come true. Additionally, click here to grab my AP Euro Review Pack, which is going to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. And if you made it this far, you are the spiciest of all, and I thank you. I'm Lerout.